If you are receiving this transmission, you are the resistance. Declaring war on the New World Order. TruthRadioShow.com And welcome to the Dan Badani Show at TruthRadioShow.com. So welcome to the Gospel of Luke, a comprehensive, in-depth study. We are on now on to chapter 11. So if you missed chapters 1 through 10, they are on our playlist. So check them out. So chapter 11, here we go. So before we get going, guys, we like we always do, uh, Bible study approach. We pray for wisdom and understanding. So let's do that right now. So Lord Jesus, Yeshua Messiah, we come to you and ask you for forgiveness for our sins and trespasses. We ask you to make us pure before the Father. Father, we ask you once again to send the Holy Spirit upon us to teach us your amazing word in today, the book of Luke chapter 11. And heal anybody out there who's going through sickness and just give them courage and hope and understanding and faith and everybody that needs uh, just comfort and, and in general, you know, comforting and help with spiritually, physically, emotionally, mentally, and we ask you to help them. And we ask you just again to help us fully understand your word today. We ask you, oh, Heavenly Father, in your precious name, amen. So that being done, guys, we read the scripture in its context. As we learn, <laughs> the last video, if you've seen it, that right at the end of the, uh, the chapter there, chapter 10, about uh, this woman, Margaret, and her sister Mary, yeah, <laughs> uh, I learned and myself at the time, you know, we went to a whole, um, uh, you know, in-depth content, excuse me, in-depth comprehensive study and learning that the context is important. Because I thought it continued on to the next chapter, then kind of checked it because it didn't. So we went back and actually examined that portion of the chapter, and we learned what it really meant. So that's why it's very important. To, and I learned again <laughs> for the millionth time to slow down, take my time, because it's not a race here. And the uh, same thing we read the scriptures all the time: slow down, take your time, absorb it before you move on. Because context is key. Remember that. And let the scripture interpret the scripture as we just did at the last video. That was a perfect example of that. And that's why I didn't edit it. I could have went back and took that out or made it better. But, you know, I th th thought that was the best because we learned something from that. I learned something as well. So um, we need to trust the plan. The only plan, and that is the Bible, guys. So let's get on with chapter 11. And it came to pass... That as he was praying in a certain place, and when he ceased, when he stopped praying, one of the disciples come up to Jesus and asked him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he's asking Jesus, one of the apostles here, could you teach us to pray the way John taught us? So taught his disciples, I'm sorry. And he said unto them, Jesus told them, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now it's his name is just glorified. Hallowed means holy. Holy is his name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as, earth, as in earth, heaven, and so also, also on earth. Now we have this, this is called the Lord's Prayer. So I want to uh, get a full understanding of this prayer because we all recited this, right? And the prayer still goes on more, but I'm going to go over the prayer, then we're going to go back and like really really examine what this prayer is. Because the words have very much power in these words. It's not just something we just recite. This is, there's meaning behind these words. So again, Jesus asked, the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the apostle asked uh, Jesus to teach us to pray the way John taught his disciples. And Jesus told him, when you go pray, right, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in earth, also in, I'm sorry, as in heaven, also on earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. And forgive us of our sins, as we also forgive everyone that is embedded into us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So before I move on, so let's examine what this uh, prayer says. 
Because it's very important to understand what you're saying. <laughs> words have power. Words are like a sword. This is a very powerful prayer. Because if you read the context of the prayer, you'll understand how powerful it is. And like I said, every time I read the scripture, I'm learning something new. So I'm going to learn something new today as well. <laughs> so, and it, now Jesus tells us when you pray, right? Say, Our Father, which art in heaven, right? So that's saying, what? Well, what is that saying? Our Father, my Heavenly Father, the Creator, God Almighty, right? He's, which is in heaven, right? Hallowed be thy name. What's hallowed be the name? Hallowed is holy. It's above all. It's basically the, the pinnacle of something, you know what I mean? So in this case, it's a name, above all names. You know, he is the holy one. There is nobody holier. Nobody bigger, nobody you know, more powerful than God. Hallowed be thy name. Holy is his name. No other name is like his. So thy kingdom come. His kingdom is coming. It will be placed here on the earth one day, right? Thy will be done. So his will. His will will be done. As we mentioned in the prior chapter too, there's nothing nobody can do to stop you. When Jesus told... Uh, one of his followers, you know, the 70 followers, I'm sorry, remember he told them that because they, they were excited that they had powers to, had the, the devils tremble to them through Jesus, because of Jesus, right? They were excited about that. And he goes, oh, yeah, because I behold, I give you the power to tread over serpents and scorpions and no harm or evil will come upon you. Serpents, scorpions, and evil and no harm will come upon you that you can tread over, right? In other words, his will be done. There's nobody going to stop you. Thy will, who's going to stop God? God's got a plan as we read in the scripture, right? There's nobody in the world or in the spiritual world that can stop that from happening. His will is going to be done the way it is and nobody's going to stop it or alter it. And if it is altered, because he did it himself. Or he allowed it to do it, but that's not the case. He's got a script written out and it's going to follow right to the letter, plain and simple. So his will will be done. As in heaven, right? And also on the earth. So God's will will be done no matter what anybody <laughs> could do about it, literally. The will you know, in heaven and the will on the earth. Heaven. And in the occult world, because we do spiritual warfare, so guys, we expose the occult and everything. All levels of the call and secret societies and all that. So they have a saying that uh, as above, so below. That's where that comes from. As above in heaven, so below is earth, right? So that's where that comes from. You'll hear that in uh, vast numbers of the occult, different levels of the occult. They're pointing up and down, and it's uh, you know, one of the statues, whatever. They're pointing up and down, or they'll have a checkerboard, like a black and white, or a blue and silver, or red and blue. Those are the three different um, sets of colors that represent equality and duality, which means as above, so below. I don't want to confuse you guys if you're not familiar with spiritual warfare. Uh, check out spiritual warfare shows. But long story short, the occult, they take everything of God and create their own mirror. Well, yeah, they take everything God and create a mirror, twisted, perverted image of that. So when you hear it in the world, like um, as above, so below, yeah. That's their version. Which is completely opposite, <laughs> even though it's like mimicking it, but it's completely opposite. And it's a whole set of meanings behind that, but I don't want to confuse you guys right now, but yeah, I just wanted to point that out because people say, well, that sounds familiar. You know, oh, I heard that so many times, as above, so below. That's where that comes from. It's the occult ripping off the Lord's Prayer. That's what it is. Pervert it. Just wanted to point that out. So, this is why the studies are good because we could get all the grasp of what this is saying. So, now, yeah, and give us our day by day our daily bread. So, we live by, you know, not bread alone, but by faith, right? Yeah, but the bread to live, 
physically, right? So give us, uh, give us what we need to live daily. In other words, your food, your water, your clothing, stuff like that. That's what that means. Day by day, our daily bread. Don't worry about the bread tomorrow, just give it to today. Like uh, uh, in Matthew says, uh, you know, the, the birds don't worry about what they're going to eat tomorrow. They know the Father's going to take care of them. They're not worrying, oh man, we're going to feed our little chicklets tomorrow. They're not up there all night sleep. You know, they go to, they go to sleep sound, safe and sound because they know the Father's going to take care of them. A bird. Which goes to the lesson that, you know, you shouldn't worry. Put your faith in the Father and you should not be worrying. So worry about today because tomorrow's got its own troubles. That's what also the scripture says, right? So this is what it's saying. And forgive us us of our sins, right? You know, as we did, we opened our show tonight. We asked for forgiveness of our sins. For we all, now this is very important. That Matthew did a big, big, big lesson on this when Jesus talked about this. In the book of Matthew. Very important, right? What do you say? If you don't forgive others, he's not going to forgive you. Plain and simple. Doesn't matter what, you, what they did to you. Forgive them. Doesn't mean you have to hang out with them. Doesn't mean you have to associate with them. Or like them again. Just forgive them and brush it away. Very important because guess what? No, I don't care what they've done to you. It could be the worst thing in the world. But guess what? If you don't forgive them, then Jesus is not going to forgive you. And there's no circumstances. No. Forgive them. Point it up. So this is, and again, forgive us of our sins, right? For we also forgive everyone that is in debt to us. That's, uh, you know, done harm against us, owes us money, this, that, and the other, right? And lead us not into temptation. And it's not like Jesus lead us into temptation. That's not what he's saying. In other words, like, we, we're asking him to help us out of the, the temptations we have. You know what I mean? Like lust of the flesh, this thing. You know, a lot of men have that. And, you know, uh, all kinds of stuff. Lust for money and like people have like a greed for money, all that stuff. Basically, all the temptations just help us out of that. But deliver us from evil. Pull us out of it. So now we examine word by word what that prayer means. Now when you say this, it's a whole new ball game now, isn't it? Because I remember saying this prayer, I was saying this prayer, not know what the certain things meant. Didn't even realize that I even knew that, you know, <laughs> to know what these meant. So now when you recite this prayer, how much more powerful is that prayer now? So let's do that right now. Let's recite it. And uh, so... Yeah, because he said when we pray, right? right? Let's pray it right out now. Together, ready? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As in earth, so in, I'm sorry, as in uh, heaven, so in earth. Give us uh, day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone that is in debt to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. So, see how much more powerful that prayer is? Knowing what it means. And by the way, there's different versions of this. Matthew is a little bit different. Because again, I have to point this out, right? It's not that there's contradictions, no. Because I know a lot of Bible study you know, scholars will be like, oh, you know, I'm not I'm scoffers. A lot of Bible scoffers is people who hate the Bible, right? They know a little bit of it, but they use it against people to try to say there's errors and contradictions. And no, there's no errors and contradictions. You got to remember, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John here, right? They're four witnesses to the same thing. They're writing a statement now. This, the, the, the New Testament's the testimony. And I, I don't mean to sound repetitive, like we, do, uh, we explained this last uh, chapter, right? Just say all of us seen something happen, right? And we all read out um, a testimony to what happened. Our words are going to be different. It might be a little slight variations, but it's the same thing. It's not a contradiction, No. So this prayer here is a little bit different than Matthew. Same stuff, though. It's just worded a little bit different. Just wanted to point that out there. That doesn't mean it's a contradiction. 
So somebody throws that at you next time, you're like, yeah. And I'm going to point all that out, too, as we go through these uh, series here. Every time I see something like that, and because um, I, I debate a lot of people, and especially these so-called uh, geniuses that like to debunk the Bible, right? And they, they do that all the time. They know most people don't know this stuff. So they'll pick something out just like that to say it's a contradiction or error when it's not. So I'm going to point them out every time, the, the ones I know of. And if you guys know any of yourself that people use, and you know, it's not a contradiction, please put it in the comment section. So verse 5, and he said unto them, Jesus told to them, the apostles, which of you shall have a friend and shall go into him at midnight and say unto him, friend, let me three loaves. So in other words, like, <laughs> Which of you will have a friend that you could go to their house at midnight, right? Just imagine you and your friends out there. And then, you know, people listening to the show right now, right? Or watching the other way. It's like, right, yeah, midnight, just go to their house, say, hey, I want to uh, borrow three loaves of bread. You know what I mean? So that's what he's asking, right? For a friend of mine in this journey is to come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he's in he, uh, you know, nothing set before him. I don't have nothing to give you. So, you know, he's saying that the friend will go to the house, ask for three loaves of bread, and that friend will have nothing to give to him, right? And he, from within, shall answer to say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut, and my child, children are in bed with, um, yeah, with, uh, let me rephrase that, guys. And my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. So that's what a normal you know, press would be like, yeah, dude, why are you here at midnight? My kids are in bed. My wife's in bed. You woke me up out of sound sleep. I'm tired. I got nothing to give you. What do you want? You know what I mean? Like, that's what he's saying. That's, uh, you know, paraphrasing what this uh, regular person would think, right? But I say unto you, right, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his impurity, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. Importantly. So, because it's important. So normally, this we say, normally because, you know, somebody banged on your door when you're friends, right? <laughs> At 12 o'clock, your family's sleeping, you woke everybody up probably, whatever. Now you're a little irritated, right? You're tired, you got to get into work in the morning, you just fell asleep. And normally you probably just shut the door in your family or friend's face, you know, you're like, dude, get the heck out of here, you know? But because if it's important, yeah, you're going to be a little frustrated, but you're going to rise up and give them the bread, what do they need? And if it's really important, and it could be anything, not just bread, you know, it's something very important. You got to rise up or you got a phone call in the middle of the night, hey, listen, I got a flat tire, I need help. And you're like, oh man, I got to get up in three hours for work, whatever, but... Guy doesn't have AAA or nothing. You, you know, like, you know what? You got to get your clothes on. You, you got to huff and puff, but you got to do it, you know, especially if it's important like that, you know? As much as you got to moan and complain all the way there, probably. And, you know, some people got to use every curse word in the book, but yeah, you still got to go there and help the person, right? So, and I say it to you, and that's what Jesus is saying help the people. If it's important, do it. Just because they're your friend or something doesn't mean you can blow them off. If it's important, help somebody. And we just learned in the last chapter about being a good Samaritan, right? Yeah. And I say unto you, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. What does that mean? For everyone that asks receives it, right? And everybody that seeks it finds it. And to him that knocks it shall be opened. What is he talking about? We're going to learn what he's talking about more. Okay, because he goes on to talk about it and explains it again, let the scripture interpret itself. <laughs> what he's saying here, too, in a spiritual way. We want you all came to the faith, right? We want to know things. I've <laughs> I've asked Jesus. Right, and he's given to me. I knocked out his door. Guess why he opened that door for me? I seeked him. 
And he, he, he found me. Well, I found him. He opened that door right up for me. So if you ask in his name, you're going to receive it. If you seek him, you will find him. You knock and that door will be open. That's what he's saying. So if you, you know, from everybody that's not really a believer right now, or you're on the border, or just not a believer at all, whatever, this is all you have to do. And you're like, well, I don't know if Jesus is real. You know what I mean? You got that doubt in your mind, or heart, whatever. And uh, it might, you know what? Ask him. He will show you. This is right there. You got to believe though. Believe in your heart that he's, that he is your savior. Ask him, he, you receive. Seek him and you'll find him. Knock at the door and he's going to open it for you. So right now it's like, Lord, let me in. Let me in so you can come into my heart. Boom, it's done. And if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, right? You're, you're saying your, your son, your child, comes up to you asking you for bread, right? Will you give him a uh, him or stone? So will you give him a, him a stone or a... Yeah, all right. <laughs> I don't want to butcher that. So, yeah, if your son asks you for some bread, right? Will you give him bread or a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a fish or a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will you offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So even he's saying even the most evil person, they're not gonna, you know, their own children. Like, if they need eggs or whatever, they're going to give it to them. They're not going to give them a scorpion. They're going to give them an egg. Because it's that's children, right? If he says, could you give me a fish? I'm not going to give you a serpent. No, you're going to give him the fish, right? So he's saying, like, um, knowing a person is evil... But he'll still give good gifts to his own children. But check this out. How much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And what do we do at the start of the show, guys? We ask the Father to give us the Holy Spirit, didn't we? So the Holy Spirit could work to us to understand us. So he's saying if even the most evil it's not just evil, but it's good people too. But if the most evil person in the world would still help their own children, right? They, normally, yes, that would happen. How much more would your Heavenly Father, that's not evil, completely opposite, would give you? Even the Holy Spirit, if you asked Him to do it. So that if you understand what He's saying, it's like yeah, the Father... <laughs> Is like better than your own parent. That's what he's saying. The heavenly, our heavenly Father is better than our biological father. Like with my son, right? The Father, the heavenly Father, is better to him than I am. Because he could give him more. He could, you know, what I mean, like nobody could be better than the Father. And if I'm not making sense to you guys, please put it in the comment section and let me know and I'll try to explain it better. But I think this explains itself. And he was casting out a devil and it was dumb. And it came to pass when the devil was going out and the dumb spoke and the people wondered. So this is a different situation now, right? So this is another counter with a devil. The dumb means like somebody that can't speak or... Uh, just de it could be a number of things, right? But it actually, it's actually meaning that person can't speak. They will call them dumb, right? And it's being probably mostly caused by the devil. That's in them. So Jesus was casting out devils 
and it was dumb, the person that he was uh, casting out devil to from. And it came to pass when the, the devil had gone out, so read it when he was casting him out. And after, after the devil, came to pass means after the devil had gone out of him, a demon, whatever you want to call it, right? The dumb person spoke. And the people wondered. So you got this guy who was possessed, can't speak, looks like a dummy, literally. Everybody knows that. You know, everybody's aware of this, knows that, and everything else, right? Now, Jesus casts the devil out. Now, all of a sudden, the guy's speaking. You're like, whoa, whoa, hold on. This guy, wow, you know, he's speaking. But some of them said he cast out devils through Bezalel, the chief of the devils, which is Satan. Another name for Satan, yeah? So basically, the people witnessing this whole thing going on, right? This uh, person, everybody knows is possessed. That's dumb, can't speak or do nothing, right? You ask him questions, doesn't even answer you. Probably looks the other way. So, complete dummy. Jesus casts it out and all of a sudden the guy's speaking, right? Now the people just, wow, whoa, wow. You know, just bedazzle, right? Yeah, but some of them, you know, of course, they, they're going to accuse him of being... To do the devil, you know, basically saying you're the devil. So how could a Satan cast out Satan, you know what I mean? <laughs> we learned more about that in Matthew. But then, yeah, again, some of them said he casts out devils through Bezalel, the chief of the devil. So they think he's using the power of Satan to cast out devils, which is an oxymoron, the thing to think. And others tempted him, sought him of him uh, from a sign of heaven. So they're saying, all right, if you are the Messiah, and this is good, Show us a sign from heaven. So you got three groups of people here. Most people were just fascinated and, and bedazzled off this. Like, wow, this is awesome. He truly is the Messiah to do this, right? Some people were like, oh, you know, I think he's of the devil himself. He's using the Satan's power to do this, which is an oxymoron thing, like I said. And others tempted him, saying, you know what? We want to see more. Show us a sign from heaven, right? But Jesus, he, knowing their fruits, and said unto them, Every kingdom divided itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided itself has fallen. Talk about the people accusing him of being the devil, right? Of, of the devil, or what, of the, uh, being the devil himself. Bezalbub is another name for Satan, the chief of the devils. So yeah, how could I how how could I be of Satan if I'm casting out Satan? Makes no sense. It doesn't. And if Satan also be divided against himself, how shall the, his kingdom stand? Because you say I cast out devils through Bezalel, <laughs> and if I be Bezalel, cast out devils. By whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. So that's another confirmation that bezel above is Satan. And devils are demons. So if you read on, it explains itself. You know what I mean? It's awesome. You know, let the scripture interpret itself. So you're saying, like, if I'm Satan, how could I cast out Satan? <laughs> you know, or, my, or his devils. It makes no sense at all. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. So it's clear as day. I, I mean, like, you just see me cast out these demons and make this person whole again. He's no longer dumb. You've just seen this happen. Would Satan do that? What would, what would the cause of Satan being do that? Because I know there's people out there, like uh, Bible scoffers, that would say, oh, you know, they try to say Satan and Jesus. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Satan, I mean, Lucifer and Jesus are the same person. There's people who actually believe that stuff. Or well, him and Satan are the same person. Does that make any sense at all? It doesn't. Because it would just defeat Satan. So if Satan's saying, oh, I'm going to make believe I'm Jesus and cast myself out just to mislead people. 
But in the end, you just mess with yourself. You just do dethrone yourself. It makes no sense at all. Jesus should, should have just looked at them and just with a, a face like, yeah, dude, get a clue before you talk. Seriously. But he had to go on and explain this because, again, of all generations. He says, if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. You're just seeing this as a kingdom of God working power, yeah. Right from the uh, kingdom of God. And he says, when a strong man armed keeps his palace, right, his goods are in peace. So in today's world, right, you got a house, you got some goods in there, family heirlooms, gems, you got a safe in there with money, whatever the case, right? So you being armed, having guns and stuff, right, and you're strong too, so you can defend yourself. This is exactly what this is, right? A strong person that can defend himself and also has firearms, right? Keeps his house secure. His goods are in peace when he's home, right? He was going to break in and steal that without getting shot, you know what I mean? And if they, he doesn't get to his guns, he's going to beat you up, you know? So, yeah. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh it from him all his armor where he trusted and is divided his spoils. So basically, if you're overtaken by several people or a bigger, stronger person with better guns or something, yeah. He that is not with me is against me, and he that is gathered not with me scattered. So he's saying, hey, you know, be, you need the arm of God. Yeah, it's good to defend your house, have firearms to do that, absolutely. But always trust in the Lord as well, you know. But anyway, he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scatters. And it's true, look at it. If you look through all through history, right? Everybody that wasn't with him, right, what happened to them? They were scattered. Every time man don't, he knows better than God, right? And still to this day, what, what happens? It leads to nothing but death and destruction. And when an unclean spirit is going out of a man, he walks through the dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. And he says, I will return into my house whence I came out. And when he comes out, he finds it sweeping and garnished. It swept and garnished. Then goes he that taketh him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And enter in and dwell in there, and the last state of man is worse than the first state. So, in this case, right, this is one guy, uh, you know, uh, uh, unclean spirit is going out of him, right? So he's like, all right, uh, I'm going to go home and rest, but he finds a rest, but he returns to his house, and when he comes to the house and finds it swept and garnished, he goes in. It takes himself uh, seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter into him and dwell there. And so he's worse than he was in the first place. And it came to pass as he spoke these things, which certain women of the company lifted up her voice. So in other words, it was a woman that was in the crowd listening. She lifted up her voice and said unto him, Bless uh, to Jesus. Blesses is the womb that bear thee. You know, it's bless, bless your mother. Mary. And the paps at which you do suck with her breasts when she, you know, breastfeed him when he was a baby. So that's when he's speaking, this woman, you know, the crowd, you know, voiced out saying, bless your mother. That's what, bless your mom. But he said to her, ye rather blessed are thee that hear the word of God and keep it. So don't bless me. Bless the bless are the, the people who hear the word of God and keep it. And when the people were gathered thick together, which means a lot of people now, like all jammed together, he began to say, "This is an evil generation. They that seek a sign, there shall be no sign give, be given, but the sign of Jonas the prophet." So remember the guy who asked, where the, the, the couple of people asked them to show us a sign from heaven. <coughs> and he goes, no, I'm not going to do that. You've just seen the sign of heaven. 
Why do I got to show you something else? But he says, yeah, no, there should, no sign will be given, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. You know what that meant? You know what that's led to, right? Jonas being in the whale for three days and three nights. You guys, you got to see that sign of Jonas the prophet. Now, mind you, Jonas the prophet, that, that happened long, long, long time ago at this point, right? So, are they people going to actually see Jonas himself come out? No. Come to life or something? No. The sign of Jonas the prophet. In other words, uh, three days and three nights in the fish. He will be in the grave for three days and three nights. Jesus will. And it goes on, right? So, for Jonas was a sign unto the nine rights, right? So shall the Son of Man be to this generation. So he goes and explains what I just said. So, you just see me cast this devil away, right? Make this guy smart now. You know, not dumb no more, right? Now you're asking for a sign from heaven? Well, guess what? I'm not going to show it to you. But you will see one coming soon. Sign from Jonas. Sign of Jonas. In other words, talk about how Jonas was a sign unto the Nevites in his time. So shall be the son of man to be in this generation here. Talk about him going into the grave real, real soon here at this uh, point in time in the, in the Bible. Him going to the grave, that's when he's crucified. And he goes into the grave for three days and three nights. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. So bringing up Solomon, right? You know how this queen came all the way to Solomon to hear his wisdom. Bringing up his, you know, all the stuff of Solomon, right? But he said, a greater than Solomon is here. That's him. Jesus. The men of Navine shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. So he's saying, hey, guys, when Jonas did this, right, people repented. But somebody greater than Jonas is here now, and you guys are not repenting? <laughs> Makes no sense, right? Yeah. So they should be repenting because somebody greater than Jonas is here with their witness. But they were sitting there uh, challenging him. And he says, No man, when he has lighted a candle, puts it in a secret place, neither under the bushel or but on a candlestick. But they which come and may see the light. So he say, no, when well, you light a candle, right? If you put it on the secret place or in the bed or just hide the candle, what's the point of it? You know, if the candle's lit, yeah, but what's the point of doing that? Because you're not going to be able to see the light. You know, the light's not going to be able to shine so you can see, right? But you put the candle in the candlestick so they can see. Otherwise, he's saying, uh, I'm not going to be a light that's going to be hidden. I'm right here. I'm a bright, shining light. You guys can't see this. <laughs> the light of the body is of the eye. Remember that old phrase like, um, the, uh, the soul's in the eye is something to be, eye of the beholder. I forgot how that went. <laughs> So yeah, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thy eye is single, thy body, thy whole body also be full of light. But when thy eye is evil, thy body is full of darkness. Yeah, so the windows to the souls through the eyes, right? That's what that you're saying is. So if you got light, you're, you are light. If it's somebody that's like uh, got darkness, there are dark, you know, they're full of darkness. He's talking about the eye being single. And a lot of people will refer that to the third eye, the penile gland, which we're not going to, you know, the occultists, once again, okay, they'll, you know, I heard a lot of cultists misuse this rest. You know, especially the New Ages and all that, and um, certain parts of Satanism and all that. They'll talk about the eye. Oh, Jesus talked about the eye. That's um, the third eye of the penile gland and all that. And what they'll do is in the occult, they'll take this. Again, a, they take their version, the single eye, right, the penile gland. 
because it's, that's where the light, is, uh, the spiritual connection, right? But they'll put a perverted twist in their own agenda. And people use this third eye in the wrong way. They use this third eye, they get, uh, in the cult, they actually encourage people to use psychotropics. You know, psychotropics is things that alter the state of consciousness. So basically, when you're using this penile gland, your third eye, you literally look into the spiritual world, right? And what you perceive to be light is actually darkness. Because you're doing um, very forbidden stuff. You know, I think you're seeking the angels and all that. These things are demonic beings. And if anybody's uh, any familiar with that kind of stuff, you know what I'm talking about, right? Trying to use the dirt eye of the penal gland for uh, occultic purposes, right? But this is talking about like uh, the light of do you, to Jesus, you know what I mean? But when the eye is evil, talk about an eye, right? Not the eyes on your head, an eye, that is single, right? Which is uh, the whole body that's talking about the spiritual, the dirt eye, when, uh, you know, especially when uh, the seal of God's put on you, it's through that third eye. And the occultists use it for evil purposes. Uh, this is a whole different, very difficult thing to explain in a short amount of time. So I don't, I don't want to confuse people with that, but um, I just want to warn people too. Any cult or like wacky religion that you know talks about using the third eye of the penal gland, the single eye, yeah, be very careful. Stay away from that. Very, very important because that's literally opening the floodgates to your soul. But I'm talking about pure demonic possession. Instantly. Something you don't want to mess with. And then, you know, the, the scriptures here tell you to keep a sober and sound mind, right? To be sound and sober at all times. Now, again, in the occult, when you actually try to open your penile gland, they encourage psychotropics and all that because they want you to open this world, the spirit world, through your mind. And yeah, you're going to see beings of light. Remember Jesus said in the, the last part of the chapters? That Satan himself, I mean, I'm Lucifer, I'm sorry, masquerades as an angel of light. Masquerades, that means they, they present to be. So a lot of these people who open the story, you know, the penile gland at, and they encounter the real spirits that look like angels, sound like angels, or talk like angels, too, right? They appear to be these beautiful, blessed light angels, right? But they're not. They're full of darkness. Very important to know this stuff because if you ever get, you know, conned into this stuff, you need to understand it. What's going on? You're not seeing angels. And when you challenge these things, then you'll see the true devils that they are. See, angels of God don't mind to be challenged. They welcome it. And they'll tell you flat out we're angels from God. These angels don't want to be challenged. They want to tell you stuff. If you obey, disobey or whatever the case, they're going to get angry. And especially if you challenge them. If they're of God, yeah, they're going to get angry real quick. And you're going to see the darkness in them. So I don't mean to jump over, like, uh, I just want to explain stuff because it's very important, yeah. And it says, Take heed, therefore, the light which is in thee be not darkness. So himself. So he's saying, The light that's in with me is, it cannot be darkness. Because it's divine light, right? If thy whole body therefore be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle does give the light. So it's a very important spiritual warfare lesson, yeah, because a lot of people read over this not knowing what this means. When you're a single eye, the whole body is also full of light. But when the eye is evil, that body is full of darkness. But when you have the thing is, like I said earlier, the people in the call, right? Their eye is evil and their body's full of darkness, but they actually think it's light. Because they get lied to and told that. There's no truth or light in them. So just people be careful with that stuff, you know what I mean? So when he spake, a certain Pharisee uh, besought him to dine with him, and he went in and sat down to meet. So his Pharisee come up to him and say, hey, Jesus, I'd like to speak with you. Um, come dine with me. So they went to go sat down to eat meat, which is food. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed his hands before dinner. 
So the Lord said to him, Now the Pharisees make clean outside of the cup of the platter, but inward parts are full of reverend and wickedness. So this goes into this too. This is explaining some more of talking about inward and outward. The light within shines out of, you know, the, in the, the darkness wind doesn't, the darkness, if you have darkness in you, it's not going to shine out. The light within is going to shine out. But anyway, he says, um, the Pharisees like, well, our tradition says you got to wash your hands. And Jesus said to him, well, now do you Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and platter? So you guys clean the outside of the cup and platter? I mean, you make clean, yeah. You The cup and platter, you present the food and drink, right? Yeah, it's clean on the outside. But do you clean the inward parts of it? In other words, they'll give you um, what he's trying to say in, this, in, the, in the way, right? You want me to wash my hands, right? But the food and drinks you serve me in, with the plates and cups there. The outside of the plate is, yeah, sparkling clean. The outside of the cup is sparkling clean. But inside the cup is filthy. In the plate, it's filthy. So it may look clean, right? May, oh, yeah, look, good presentation, but inside it's contaminated. And Jesus goes on, this is awesome. You fools. Did not he that make witches uh, without make the witches within also? But rather give alms on such things of ye, and behold, all things are clean unto you. So I just you right, right away choose them out because they're like, oh, you guys, hey, you guys don't wash your hands. That's uh, true. In the, in the book of Matthew, it goes into a little bit detail too about this because they don't wash hands. That tradition. You have to wash hands. And Jesus is trying to teach him a lesson off this right here. So, and he says, uh, yeah, you know, fools, because the person that made, which is without make, uh, which also within. <laughs> and but rather give alms, which is like doing good things or on things, of ye, and behold, all things are clean unto you. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye die mint and rue in all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment in the love of God. Uh, these ought ye to have not done, and have not leave uh, uh, underdone. So woe unto you, Pharisees, for you love the outermost seats in the synagogues, and the greetings in the market. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are as the graves which appear not, and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. So what this is saying, right? How evil is. Again, the eye is evil. That means your, your, your body's going to be full of darkness. If your eye is light, it's going to be full of light. You know, in goodness. And he's saying, yeah, the, the Pharisees, like, these, they, talk, they talk about the traditions, right? And he's trying to tell them, you're going to follow God, not man. And he goes, yeah, everything you guys do, everything you guys do, everything you have looks beautiful on the outside. Your clothes, your personality, your plates, your cups. When you go into the synagogues, you sit in the, the, the big, you know, the uppermost seats. In other words, the, the VIP section, if you will. When you go into the markets, people greet you everywhere you go. And remember, these are the same Pharisees described to try to goad him to say something wrong to try to kill him, which they end up doing later on with the crucifixion. But he calls them hypocrites. And here, yeah, it's like, and he says, For you are as graves which appear not, that the men walk over them and see them and not aware of them. So, yeah, you're a bunch of graves, but people walk, they can't see the graves, but they're walking over them and they have no idea that you know, you're evil people. Very wicked people. You appear to be uh, righteous, but you're evil people. 
Then answered one of the lawyers said unto him, one of the lawyers uh, answered and said unto Jesus, Master, thus saying thou reproach us also? And he said, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers, for ye laid men with burdens grievous to be born, and you yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. So, yeah, he's saying, you lawyers, yeah, yeah, you laid men with burdens, who used to be born. In other words, like, you laid, like, um, with people who have all these inflictions and, like, um, like crimes and everything else that, you know, bad stuff going on with them, but you yourselves have never even uh, touched one of these burdens before. So you try to help people with burdens, but you never had these burdens. And woe unto you, for ye built the sepulchres of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. So you, you see what Jesus is saying here? Yeah, you build the sepulchres for the prophets, right? Oh, that's a good thing, yeah. Look at those beautiful sepulchres. The graves, right? But you're the ones that killed them. <laughs> it's like you're a murderer, right? Like, you know, if somebody comes up and murders you, to look into the people, they'll build a nice grave for you. They'll pay for the funeral and everything else, right? Make it look beautiful. It's like trying to put lipstick on a pig, you know? <laughs> but truly ye bear witness that ye allowed the deeds of your fathers, for your, for they, I'm sorry, indeed killed them, and ye build their sepulchres. So you say your fathers, you know, talking to the scribes and all that, right? You killed the prophets. Then later you build them. You know, the, your fathers killed the prophets and now you're building the sepulchres for them. Therefore also the wisdom of God. I will send them prophets and apostles and some of them shall slay, shall slay and persecute. And that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. So that's some serious stuff going on here, right? And from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. So of all the people that perished over the generations, right? From these evil men, this generation I talk about, uh, these people here, because remember, this generation they talk about, they're the ones who put him to death. They're the ones who put Jesus to death, too. You know, him to death during the, you know, the crucifixion, right? But he says, this generation's going to pay a heavy price. And I know it did. When the second temple crumbled down like he said it would, when not one stone will be left upon each other, yeah, you know, they paid a heavy price. And from thenceforward, they've been, uh, yeah, generation after generation has been paying the, for the curses of this. And, you know, Israel recently became a nation again back in 1947. But prior to that, they were slaves. They were, oh, man, yeah, you know what happened to history. But woe unto you, warriors, for you have taken away the key of knowledge, but you entered not yourselves and them that were entering into Hindu. So you take away the keys of our knowledge, and you didn't enter yourself, but you entered the people into it. That you would be hindered. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and provoke him to speak of many things. So now that they're, they're ticked off. Because Jesus just put them flat in that place. Because as you see in the common trend through Matthew, Mark, and now Luke, right? If you've been following the series here, the Pharisees and scribes, the elders, and the priests are trying to do everything in their power to go Jesus, to provoke him to say something dumb or blasphemous that violates their laws so they have something on him to kill him. Because Jesus is waking people up by the multitudes. And right now, they, the thing is, if they had it their way, they would have captured Jesus and put him to death right away, but they know the multitudes of people would attack them and would rebel against him. So they need a reason. Well, he violated the law, and under the law they have to kill him, right? 
So that's why they're trying to goad him. You can see the common trend. They're trying to always goad him into things. That's why they say, oh, come come to um." They knew darn well. They knew that he wasn't going to wash his hands. They did that purposely to provoke him to stuff, right? But every time Jesus fired back and gave it right back to him. And it failed. And he said, you know, these things unto them, the scribes and Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak many things. And lay in wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. So like I just said, right? They're looking for any reason to say, oh, he, he committed blasphemy. Jesus, right? That Jesus committed blasphemy or he violated the law and that's the reason for us to put him to death, right? And even up to his death, they found none. <laughs> and we're going to get into that later. But they're doing everything in their power to take Jesus out. I just, just seen all through here and Jesus just handed it right back to them again. Amazing stuff. So, and this continues on to um, in the next chapter here and leading up to his crucifixion. So they're looking for anything possible to crucify Jesus. Which they never had the reason in the first place. So, yeah, we'll get into that later. But thank you guys for joining us for chapter 11. And I know it was a little tongue-tied today uh, because of you know, it's old English, you know, the King James. And I, don't, I don't like to use the newer Bibles. So I'd rather use a, a King James Version, take it to my time to try and understand it. Or the Geneva or something older, you know. Because uh, the newer Bibles, I, I don't trust them at all. They remove keywords, they change keywords, they completely remove entire scriptures. So, you know, entire verses, I'm sorry. So I'm not going to even deal with that. I want to get right from the, the good sources here. So, and if, a lot of times it takes time to understand it, especially King James. It'll just take time to understand and read it. And you can see the pattern he's going down and what he's talking about. That's the key part of it, the context and key. And again, remember he says, Jonas and the whale there? Yeah. Jonas was in the, the whale for three days and three nights, right? Jonas prophet. The sign of Jonas, that was the, him and the whale, right? That's the same thing that's going to happen to him, but he's going to be in a grave for three days and three nights. Jesus. Which that's coming up soon. So, if guys, if you missed chapters 1 through uh, 10 there, please uh, look in the uh, playlist here. And if you've got any questions, comments, or concerns, uh, just put it in the regular comment section. And when this video does premiere, uh, during the premiere, uh, we have a live chat. So please engage in the live chat. We usually premiere the shows about 6 o'clock on uh, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, on well, noon on Saturdays, whatever case. But um, the times always may be different sometimes. But when you do, if you're lucky enough to catch the premiere, please engage in the chat room there with uh, other believers and uh, fellowship with them. And again, if you got comments for me, your questions, uh, right in the regular comment section, put it there, and I'll get to you. And if you want to add some, you know, say, Dan, you missed this, whatever, you know, correct me, you know what I mean? Because God says to challenge every spirit. And I am more, always open for correction. So, yeah, because I'm learning as I go along myself. So, you guys like like our show, go to truthradioshow.com to catch our spiritual warfare shows. We've got all kinds of shows going on over there, me and Brian Reese. So check it out, truthradioshow.com. And it's uh, links to all social media and uh, uh, platforms, video platforms and all that good stuff. So thank you for joining us to the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, a comprehensive in-depth study of chapter 11. We will see you for chapter 12. So shalom, God bless, and remember, you are the resistance. And guys, I'll uh, remind you, if you want to stay in the chat room for a little while longer, hit pause right now on the video, because once the video ends, it's going to kick you out of the chat. So if you hit pause on the video, we'll buy you some more time into the chat room during uh, the presentation, the premiere. So God bless again.